is the last video about uh, the lesson on the Middle East uh, since the beginning of the 20th century and uh, part 3 is about the post-Cold War period so uh, since the early 90s um, at the world scale and also the scale of the Middle East uh, this period has been a period of uh, important US interventionism due to uh, the new position uh, gained by the USA at the end of the Cold War of uh, the, the leading uh, and only superpower in the world and uh, regarding uh, well th this, this aspect of things it is really a period that is over today it's not true to see the exact ending but uh, I believe in the future we will feel that uh, war in Syria or, or, or the election of Donald Trump uh, will become the you know the turning point uh, I in the history of the Middle East. Anyway, uh, if the question of this part three was uh, did the conflict of the Middle East get better during the the post Cold War period, the answer was uh, would certainly be no. Uh, first point will be about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the last thing we talked about when we mentioned the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was the creation of the Palestine Liberation Organization uh, I had mentioned that um, at the in the late 80s PLO had started a strategy based on uh, popular uprisings and popular uh, unrest uh, that aim to, to catch the attention of the international media and the international community over the fate of the Palestinians. It must be said that uh, to a large extent this strategy seemed to work as uh, at the United Nations and more generally in the world um, the, the Palestinian issue uh, was something that interested a lot of people in the uh, early 90s. In fact, uh, Norway, a traditionally neutral state, um, decided to, to start a process of secret negotiation between Israel and the Palestinians. And this was known as the Oslo uh, process. And the conclusion of the Oslo process was the signature of uh, a historic agreement between Israel and uh, and the Palestinians. This, uh, these Oslo Accords were signed under the aegis of the USA, as you can see President Clinton on this very famous photograph now, and uh, the fact that uh, Israeli Prime Minister Rabin, who so was from the Labour Party, the left of the uh, Israel uh, political life, and uh, Arafat, the PLO leader, the fact that they shook hands uh, uh, on that day was really a sign of hope. They agreed on a plan uh, whose goal was the uh, eventual creation of two states as a solution to uh, the problem of, of Palestine. I in practice uh, a state of Palestine was not created at that moment but it was planned that the occupied territories of Gaza and the West Bank would become someday uh, a Palestinian state. Anyway, for the moment, Israel uh, accepted to recognize the existence of a Palestinian national authority. So not exactly a state. Um, the problem is that the Oslo Accords were in fact the peak of uh, a peace between Israel and Palestine. Well, indeed, in, in both camps, uh, the radicals and those who did not want peace in the end they won over. Uh, in Israel in particular, um, Prime Minister Rabin got murdered in 1995 and he was not killed by a Muslim, he was killed by a Jewish extremist who blamed him for being too, uh, too, too soft with the Palestinian problem. Uh, from, from this moment uh, the trend towards more radicalism uh, could not be stopped. Ever since uh, the 90s, most of the Israeli governments have been right-wing, and so uh, their attitude to uh, the Palestinian problem 
uh, has become tougher and tougher. A good example of this is that in the year 2000, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon uh, made a provocative visit of the Temple Mount uh, in, in Jerusalem and uh, he, he tried to obtain uh, the launching of a new war with the Palestinians, which happened, was called the Second Intifada. So um, clearly uh, the policy that was chosen by, by Israel uh, w was a policy of confrontation with the Palestinians. And this has been the result. Okay. Uh, in practice, Israel has gained control over larger and larger areas in the West Bank. Uh, what you can see on this map is uh, a map that dates back to a bit more than um, 14 years ago and which shows the West Bank and how much it has been colonized by Israel. In fact, uh, Israeli colonists are often very religious people who, uh, who really believe they are fighting some kind of holy war in regaining land in the West Bank. And so they build colonies and they get the support of the army, uh, the army of Israel, who is present in the area. And so uh, it, it is clearly a kind of invasion policy which has been largely condemned by the United Nations but thanks to the support of the USA there has never been any kind of military pressure put on Israel for, for having it putting an end to colonization. So this is what it looks from, uh, from above and on the ground okay uh, what you can see in the bottom right corner is uh, an example of an Israeli colony in the West Bank uh, in the bottom left corner you can see the wall which uh, has been built um, in order to protect these colonies and you can see them from above on the aerial picture. So this is the situation uh, now. Uh, in both camps the radicals have won. We have talked about I Israel so far. We could also talk about the fact that uh, for the Palestinians uh, the, the movement, the party of Arafat called the Fatah, has been clearly challenged by a more radical um, movement, which is in fact an Islamist movement, movement called Hamas. And Hamas has totally won over the public opinion and the authority over... Uh, this is what Gaza looks like nowadays. Uh, in fact, since the, the second intifada, there has been uh, a process which has given some autonomy to Gaza and so it is now totally governed by the Hamas. But Gaza is in constant war with Israel, I mean the, with the Hamas uh, launching rockets from time to time on Israel and the Israeli army regularly attacking Gaza in retaliation. So, so Gaza uh, looks like hell on earth nowadays and uh, for uh, m millions of civilians who live there the situation is extremely difficult because there is a total embargo of uh, Israel on, on this place. It cannot trade freely with the rest of the world and uh, well, things are only getting worse for the people, for the people there. Uh, something that is not in your syllabus because it's too recent, but um, if I had to say, if I had to evaluate the future of this situation in Palestine, I would probably say that uh, Israel I is currently winning over thanks to its policy uh, which is a very active policy of colonization and thanks to the increased support of the USA. The Obama administration was not extremely supportive of Israel but it still was. The Trump administration is very supportive of Israel in the sense that um, in 2017, the USA officially recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, something that Israel has alway, had always wanted, but that no other government in the world had dared to, to accept because it would be a blow for the Palestinians. Well, Trump dared to make these decisions and it was followed by some countries like Australia, for example. So, um, 
support to Israel uh, on a very right-wing stance ha has increased recently. The other point uh, that must be examined about the, the post-Cold War period was the question of maintenance of order there. So after the Cold War, uh, it, it was clear that uh, only the USA was now able to have an interventionist policy in the Middle East. And uh, you may remember from the, uh, the lesson about the USA and the world that in 1990, when uh, Iraq had invaded Kuwait, um, the president of the USA of the moment, George Bush, pronounced a famous phrase where he talked about a new world order that could emerge from the first Gulf War. Uh, what he said, what he meant was that the the United Nations and the powerful countries of the world could, could use the First Gulf War as an example of how they could maintain peace and order in the world. In fact, uh, it did not happen this way. I mean, the consequence was not more peace. Indeed, um, there is, uh, there's been a huge US influence uh, since the First Gulf War. But for uh, the Muslim world, it was largely seen as an act of imperialism. So an anti-American feeling has grown all over the Muslim world, not necessarily among the governments, but among the people, the public opinion. And so the result of this has been the development of more radical Islamist terrorist movements. Uh, everybody is not a terrorist, of course, but some of them uh, act like terrorists. And of course, the 9-11 attacks in 2001 mark the peak of this uh, radical action taken by some terrorists against the USA. And the response of the USA to this was an even greater interventionism in the Middle East, with the invasion of Afghanistan immediately after the attacks, and uh, much more importantly, with the invasion of Iraq two years after, without any UN support, and in fact, with only the pretext of maintaining order. Because even though uh, after a few months of fight, George Bush could say that mission was accomplished in Iraq, and even though Saddam Hussein had fallen from power, ever since this war in Iraq, uh, instability, violent instability, in fact, civil war, never stopped in Iraq, like in many other countries of the region. And so we may wonder, uh, in the ending part, is the Middle East more unstable than ever? What well, I think it is. We've talked about Iraq several times, and the problem in Iraq is that the country is divided ethnically and religiously. Well, from these divisions, which have been uh, sparked again with the uh, 2003 uh, war, well, the ISIS, uh, movement has emerged. Uh, ISIS is a radical Sunni movement which has first of all uh, fought a war against the Shia power in Iraq that took over after Saddam Hussein. That's just an example of how unstable the Middle East has been. The result was not more democracy. Uh, apart from Tunisia, maybe, in many countries, eventually, in Egypt, the army took over. And in other countries, the government was not defeated by popular uprising, but it led to civil war. The tragic example is Syria, of course. Since 2011, this very complex country has been at war. And I found this um, chart in the bottom left corner that tries to summarize uh, who are the actors of this war, but it's extremely complex, of course. It is a civil war which has many international um, links with Russia, with the USA, with Europe. In fact, it is true of many conflicts of the moment in the Middle East. They are both local and international, which makes them extremely complex. Let's not forget that the instability in the Middle East uh, has led to a war, to a violence which can be exported, and terrorist violence has touched many other areas in the world. 
And in fact, the result of all this is that democracy is almost absent from all over the Middle East, even today, even more than one century after the Sykes-Picot Accord. So uh, the century that has ended in the Middle East was certainly a century of conflict, but not a pathway to democracy. <laughs>